I was given permission to just tell one story, <laughs> but when you're board president, you sometimes can skirt the rules. So I'm going to tell two stories. But first, I would especially like to thank our architects, Corrigan, for this building. When you tour it today, you'll see 120,000 square feet. But the most important thing to me is we designed it to be expandable. So just last week, for example, I was reading an article and it was talking about 5D printers. Now, when you tour the building, you'll see 3D printers. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, what happened to 4D printers? They're already talking about 5D printers. So we can expand this building for things that none of us can even dream of right now that in 10 years will be relevant. One of the things we're actually talking about right now is because the airline industry needs pilots, mechanics. I bet that'll be the next program in two or three years that we'll have here. But now the first story, it's about Clarence Reed. And it starts because of that road right behind the building. You know it as George Bush or the Bush. But Clarence Reed and I knew it in the late 80s as Highway 190. Because in Rowlett at that time where we both lived, there were what called the 190 wars, where the routing would be of Highway 190. And so somehow my wife and I got invited to one of the groups. And uh, because my politics were mainly in Washington, I sat on a couch in the other room and was reading a book uh, about the Civil War. And this gentleman comes over and int introduces himself as Clarence Reed. And he sits down. He says, what are you reading? I said, oh, it's called Battle Cry of Freedom. Just came out about the Civil War. And he sat down. And for the next two hours, we talked about the Civil War. He was an expert on the Civil War, especially all the stuff that happened west of the Mississippi. Amazing, amazing stories he told me. A few weeks later, it was the next meeting, and I was again sitting on the couch doing the Sunday Times crossword puzzle. He came over and said, I love to do crossword puzzles. I've never done the Sunday Times. Could we do it together? In less than an hour, we had completed the Sunday Times crossword puzzle. And there was a word that I've never told Jed or, or his family that I think certainly applied to Clarence Reed. It's called polymath. It's a person who knows a lot about a lot of different subjects. So at the next meeting, he came over to me and says, I have a present for you. See, what had happened was when we were doing the crossword puzzle, there was a question, a uh, bottom feeder began with F, ended in R, eight letters, and I said flounder. So he said, well, are you a fisherman? I said, well, I, I've done some fishing in the Atlantic Ocean. He said, that's not fishing. So at that meeting, he gave me this book, The Bass Fisherman's Bible, because <laughs> apparently he was an expert on bass fishing. So about a year later, uh, I called him up. I said, just guess where I just came from? He says, I don't know. I said, I just went to fish Lake Fork, the best bass lake in the United States. And I brought your book along, and I read it, and there was silence, just total silence. I said, Clarence, you still there? And he started laughing. He said, do you know the expression fish or cut bait? And I said, yeah. He said, it's not fish or cut bait or bring a book to read while you're fishing. <laughs> he, he said, where'd that come from? And I, I said, well, he said, well, how did you do? I said, well, I caught everything. I caught every single log and tree. We lost all our hooks. And remember, he was a teacher, as you heard from his son. And he said, no, 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 you failed the course. Next time, read the book first. So a year later, I called him up. I said, guess where I was? And he said, Lake Fork. He said, did you take the book? No. Did you read the book ahead of time? Yes. How'd you do? I said, I caught a 12-pound bass. He said, I am going to give you an A minus, not an A. If you'd done that the first time, you got an A. <laughs> this time, you get an A minus. Now, the story um, about, the, about Dr. Gilberts is a little different. It's not about a highway, but it's about this email. So I was running for office in 2007, and in comes this email. How do you feel about vocational education in Garland? Is there a real need for it? Should we be preparing the students for college instead? Please let me know. So normally, my response would have been, uh, yes, every student should go to college. 
but there had just been a series of articles in the Wall Street Journal about the need for CTE programs, not only for the kids who never went to college, but because of the tremendous percentage of kids who go to college and never get a degree. And so I wrote back to the person who, I didn't know who it was, and gave the response. And as I pressed the button, I said, well, there's a vote I just lost, maybe several. But a few days later, the person responded and said, I teach CTE in Garland. I've sent your response to everybody I know, and we're all voting for you. So a miracle passes, and I win the election. The next day, I called up Dr. Colwell, and I said, I need to talk to whoever runs CTE in the district. He says, I'll set up a meeting tomorrow with Dr. Gilbreth. And we've known each other now for 11 years. But the real story is kind of one he hinted at when he talked about all the visits he made to CTE buildings around the country. On one of those visits, he invited me along to go to Grand Prairie, their new Dubisky CTE Center. And by the way, which he didn't refer to, the director of CTE said to me as we were touring the building, by the way, do you know you have the best CTE director, not just in the Metroplex, not just in the state, but in the United States. So congratulations. And he has won awards for that exact reason. So, so while we were touring the CTE, we got to the medical wing and the director of medical wing said, we just got this incredible new mannequin. And they referred it to as the $30,000 dummy. And on the way back to GISD, I said to, to Dr. Gilbert, are we going to have one of those in the new wing at North Garland High School that we just built? And he says, I'm sure we will. So he called me a few weeks later and said, we don't have one there, but it's on the way. Then a couple of months later, he called me back and he said, I have two surprises for you the next time you go to North Garland High School. So there was a tour scheduled a few weeks later, and I'm touring the building with one of the students, and we get to the medical wing, and she says, we have this brand new $30,000 dummy. And I go, yes. <laughs> then she says, now normally when we get these dummies, the students are allowed to name the dummies. <laughs> Except in this case, we got word from the administration that we had to give it a certain name. The name was Larry. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, my wife always says I have no brains. At least I now have a net worth of $30,000. So I just have one question before I do the dedication for Dr. Gilbert, because I know there are at least three new dummies on the way to this building, and the question is, what will names will they be given? So on behalf of the Board of Trustees and Dr. Crone, and now... Dr. Lopez, we officially dedicate the Gilbert Reed Career and Tech Center on behalf of our faculty, our students, and most importantly, on behalf of the citizens of our three cities who all understand the importance of great edu education. And I'd like the trustees to join me as we unveil these plaques. to Dr. Crump. 